Good afternoon all, welcome to part four of Tax Foundation University for 2018. Uh, my name is Steve Enton, I'm senior fellow at the Tax Foundation. I used to work here on the Hill in the 1970s, back in the time of stagflation when we had double digit inflation and inadequate growth. And that was a time when people began looking at the economy a little bit differently uh, instead of all of this uh, adding up consumption and investment in government spending and looking at demand, we began to look at the impact of taxes on various markets, including the labor and capital markets. And that came to give us a new way of uh, predicting what would happen when you change tax policy uh, and uh, what would happen if the Federal Reserve did this or that. A kind of the new type of economics, which is now gradually being put into the economic models. What I'd like to get across today are really three key points. Imposing a tax creates a wedge, a, a break between the sales price and what you get to keep uh, at the margin that raises the price, reduces the return to the seller, reduces the activity, and creates what we call a deadweight loss. Second point, the tax base and the tax rates interact. The tax rates may cause you to change your behavior and the thing being taxed may rise or fall in quantity. And because of that, the effective tax rates at the margin can exceed the statutory rate because of impacts on the base. Third point, some activities are taxed more than once. And of course, if you do that, the rates compound and you get a much higher rate than you might think you have looking only at one piece of the activity. Those are three key points to remember. So the first point is the imposition of a tax. This is on anything you're taxing. The quantity uh, here is on the bottom, the price is up on the left axis. As prices rise, people are willing to supply more of the product. But as prices rise, people are willing to buy less of the product. At some point, the price the supplier wants and the price that the consumer is willing to pay come together at point E naught, and you have your original quantity. Now, when we put on a tax, we force the price up to the consumer we force the uh, after-tax price down to the producer. That's the vertical line between the top P and the bottom P on the axis. That's the tax rate per unit. And then we have the quantity. But notice, because of the tax and this split between the two prices, the price to the consumer has gone up, the quantity demanded goes down. The price to the supplier goes down, the quantity supplied goes down, and we have a lower quantity with the tax than without. So when you calculate the revenue, you have to take account of the fact that the tax is going to alter the original base and you're going to get less of it. Now, joint tax and treasury do this routinely when you put a higher tax on cigarettes or gasoline or anything like that, an excise tax. Um, but they tend not to do it if you tax labor and you tax capital and income. They don't tend, or at least they used not to tend, to show the impact on the total economy uh, of these major taxes. They would do the base adjustment mainly for the excises. And of course, uh, we know now that the taxes on labor and capital do affect the size of the economy, and they are beginning to do more macroeconomic analysis of tax changes than they used to, and that's a big step forward. Now, the tax wedge I'm referring to is that little tri that pair of triangles uh, near where the tax is imposed, on the right there. and. Um, and part of that is the loss in value to the consumer and part is the loss in value to the producer. And the area under the trapezoid, under the uh, supply curve, un under that supply curve, is resources that can be shifted from this excise tax area into other uses. It's abandoned by the supplier. But the enjoyment of the product is the area under the demand curve, the top curve. And you can see that the enjoyment is bigger than the resource cost until you get right to the point where you're at the margin equal. And that means that there's some dead weight loss in pleasure, utility, value uh, from having to squash this activity down and put the resources somewhere else. And these dead weight losses are fairly large. Now, <clears throat> the dead weight loss of a tax rises with the square of the tax rate. The area of a triangle is one half the base times the height, so you've got some, something multiplied by something else. And what you see there is a unit tax has one triangle's worth of loss, a two unit tax has 
four triangles worth of loss and a 3% tax has uh, nine triangles <laughs> worth of loss. So if you have a sales tax that's a flat 2% on everything, you've got four units of loss. But if half of them is taxed at 1% and half of the items in your sales tax are taxed at 3%, there's additional loss on the 3% that's bigger than the saving on the 1%, and you end up with a um, five unit loss instead of a four unit loss because you've taxed things unequally in your sales tax. So uneven taxation is economically da more damaging than even handed taxation. Uh, put it another way, if you're going to put a sales tax on cars and you put a 10% sales tax on red cars and a 2% sales tax on green cars, why would you do that? You, uh, there's no harm in switching from one color to another, you're just creating uh, uh, distortions in consumption that would not otherwise occur. Now that has some implications when you consider the income tax with its graduated tax rates, doesn't it? Because you have producers who at the margin may be in a low tax bracket, a middle tax bracket, or a high tax bracket, and if for some reason you want more output, do you want it to come from the more efficient producer or the less efficient producer? When you have graduated rates, sometimes the more efficient producer says, I'm, I'm done, I don't want to do any more. And the less efficient producer says, all right, I'll try it, but it's going to cost you more than it would if you came from the more efficient source. And uh, that may not seem like it's terribly important, but suppose you had a drought and famine in Africa and you were trying to expand agricultural production in the United States, and it was the small farms with lots of stones in the field that were, worth, were, were willing to go forward and do more, and the farmers that had already produced a huge amount on their very fertile land, said, you know what, the tax burden is too high, I'm not gonna bother expanding. You, you wouldn't want to distort production in that way. <clears throat> the higher the tax rate, the more the base shrinks. Now, if the tax is low, it only shrinks the base a little bit, and of course, you had no tax before, so you've got revenue, and that's a big increase in revenue. As the tax rate goes higher and higher, the base shrinks more and more, as you can see. And you get that middle block which is the maximum amount of revenue you're going to get. If you push the tax any higher, the percentage shrinkage in the quantity is bigger than the percentage increase in the tax rate, so the total revenue goes down. And this leads us to the famous or infamous Laffer curve. <clears throat> At a zero tax rate, there's no revenue. At a 100% tax rate, nobody's gonna produce anything, so again, there's zero revenue. As you raise the tax rate, Revenues rise, reaches a peak, and it begins to decline. Now, where's the ideal tax point? Well, if you're terribly Washington-oriented, it might be point B, the point of maximum revenue. But what you're doing here is you are so depressing the economy with the added tax that there's no revenue gain. And your revenue rate is a fractional rate, which means the economy is falling several dollars to wipe out your tax increase. So you're getting no revenue and the economy shrunk several dollars in the process. That's clearly not the beneficial point. The beneficial point is further to the left somewhere where the tax revenue raised plus the damage to the economy add up to equal the value of whatever it is you're providing through government with the revenue. And you don't want to push things beyond that point. Very few taxes are over the hump in the Laffer curve. We'll get into this perhaps a little more next week, but uh, don't think that every tax cut that you have is going to create so much growth that the revenues are going to pour in and it's going to pay for itself. In the first place, it changes the growth for a while and it levels up the economy to a higher point, but that's, that's the adjustment. It doesn't keep going up and up and up faster. It's going to stay at a higher point if you cut taxes in, in an appropriate manner. Uh, but the other point is that most taxes are not in the so-called prohibitive range. We've identified a couple that probably are. We believe the estate tax is over the hill. And we believe that slow depreciation, long drawn out asset lives cost more in revenue than they bring in uh, because of the damaging effect of the economy, on the economy. The, the corporate tax rate we think comes fairly close, doesn't quite get there, but it, it's fairly damaging. But I don't think it's quite over the hump. Um, but it has other problems about chasing capital out of the country and distorting. Uh, uh, choices that to make it a very bad tax. Uh, but other taxes are, are over on the normal range. It's just that you can't say, I'm going to raise a dollar in tax and I'm going to give you a dollar's worth of services and you'll be held harmless. You won't, because there will still be some damage to the economy that you need to take in. I tell the members that they have notepads up here. I say, if you 
if the, if the General Services Administration says this is a dollar's worth of a notepad and you've raised a dollar's worth of tax to pay for it, you've probably cost the economy an initial dollar or two. And the initial dollar or two, it means that that pad is really costing three dollars, not one, and you should factor that into your budget. And they don't, of course. But uh, that's what they really should be doing. Okay. Uh, let's put the tax not on cigarettes or gasoline, let's put it on the labor market. Let's have a payroll tax or the income tax on wages, for example. You still have the wedge. You have the tax rate times the tax base. Now, I've shown the supply curve as being very steep. That means that labor is somewhat inelastic in supply. The tax doesn't affect the quantity a lot. It's not zero, but it's not huge. And there's debate in the economics profession as to how big that labor supply elasticity is. We use 0.3. Uh, a $10 increase in the after-tax wage, a 10% increase in the after-tax wage will give you a 3% increase in hours worked in people entering the force, labor force. Um, the Joint Tax Committee says, well, it starts at a 0.29, but, but the higher income people have makes them more willing to take a little leisure, so we're going to knock that down to 0.19, or about 0.2. But between 0.2 and 0.3, it's not much of a difference in the outcome of the modeling. Uh, <clears throat> Friedman and others would have disputed that income effect. Uh, if the government cuts taxes uh, but doesn't cut its spending, it has to issue more debt. And somebody has to buy the debt, and they don't have the additional income to spend. Uh, so the income effect is a little questionable. Or to put it another way, if you have something like the payroll tax, where we take it from one side of the room and give it to the retirees on the other side of the room, your income's gone down, your income's gone up, plus one, minus one equals zero. Tax transfer, tax transfer systems do not start out by changing income in total. So that's a questionable thing. So we use 0.3, but you could, you could use another number. Capital is far more elastic in supply. If I'm going to save and invest and I'm going to build a factory and I could build it in Canada or here or in France or here or wherever, um, if the tax climate is bad here and better there, I might put it there instead of here because of the tax difference. But there's another factor to consider. If you beat up on saving and investment, people can say, I've done enough, I'm not going to do anymore. I'm going to go take a trip around the world or I'm going to buy a new car, I'm going to consume rather than invest. So the total quantity of factories that you're willing to own may shrink. So there are two reasons why capital is in very elastic supply. It will flee high taxation and can get away with it more than labor. With labor, if you're working for someone else, they set the hours, or if you don't work, you don't eat. But with saving versus consumption, they're both nice. And if one turns bad because of the tax, I'll do the other. Consuming's fun, too. So capital is in highly elastic supply. In fact, we use that relationship in our model, because when you change that tax wedge on capital, suppose I cut the tax and the uh, rate of return on capital, K1, goes up. Well, that's higher than I really need in my infinitely elastic supply, so I'm going to add to the capital stock till I drive the gross return back down enough to eat up the uh, cut in the tax. And I'm left again with the same after-tax return as before, but with a higher capital stock. So capital competes away its higher returns until you get back down to this net return. The net return can be thought of as what economists call the marginal rate of time preference which is we know a dollar today and a dollar five years from now aren't the same thing, and what is the rate we kind of discounted at? We seem to discount it at about 3%. That seems to be a human characteristic, and it's been true for, hundred, well, it's been true for at least 150 years. Uh, you go back to the Napoleonic Wars, the British guilts were yielding 3%. Uh, I mean, this is a very basic kind of, of uh, time sense that we seem to have. Now, measuring the wedges, which we can get from data from the IRS and the Commerce Department. And um, the quantities of capital and labor, we know that capital plus labor produce, and we know the relationship there. It's called a production function. And we can tell you pretty much what will happen to the GDP, total output, if you change these wedges. That's how our model works. We don't add up C plus I plus G, all the demand, all the spending, and try and guess what it's going to be spent on. We actually calculate 
where we think the capital stock is going to end up, knowing everything about the capital stock and the way we tax it, including the depreciation rules and the tax rates and what kind of business you have and all the rest of it. We can calculate the wedges, and that drives our model. Given that capital is very elastic and the supply of labor is less elastic, there's something called Ramsey efficiency. See, ideally, you'd find a tax base that doesn't shrink when you tax it. Years and years ago, there was a cartoon strip by somebody who must have been an economics major as an undergraduate, because it's called The Colonials, and it was Plymouth Rock, and John Alden, and Priscilla, and the governor, and the preacher. And the preacher's sitting by Plymouth Rock, and he's upset because he's preaching against sin, and people keep sinning. And he asks God, do you really want me to continue to preach? And a lightning bolt strikes his hat and uh, breaks the rock, and, and he takes this as a positive sign. I would have taken it as a negative sign. But he runs to the governor and he says, Governor, I have preached against sin. I have invaded against sin. I have cajoled against sin. But the people will sin. And Governor Bradford says, then by Jove, we'll tax it. Not to stamp it out, but because it's the perfect tax base. You can tax it and tax it and tax it, and it won't collapse. Now, I don't think Governor Bradford would have sworn on a pagan deity because the pilgrims were, you know. but. It gets the point across, I think. So in Ramsey efficiency, you put more of a tax on the thing that shrinks the less and less of a tax on the shrink thing that shrinks the most in order to avoid distorting the economy. So if you run into somebody who says, labor's inelastic, it doesn't do any good to cut their marginal rates, you can say, well, then it's the ideal tax base. We should put all of our taxes on labor. And then they say, no, no, that's not what I meant. But you see, what, what the idea comes from is, is basic uh, economic theory. Uh, when we measure these uh, wedges and we see how much capital and labor are likely to change if you change the tax system one way or another, <clears throat> we can see what the cost of capital is, what that wedge is. In other words, that marginal rate of time preference plus the taxes yield you a required return in order to pay your taxes and still leave you what you need to have to satisfy your marginal rate of time preference. That's the cost of capital. And then there's the wedge on labor and the after-tax wage is what people work for, so we know what happens to that. So we can calculate the amount of labor and the amount of capital, the size of the capital stock, the size of the labor supply, and we can get the amount of output in the economy. And that's working from the supply of labor and capital up to the production. Now, of course, you're paid for your labor and your capital services, so you get paid, and that's wages going to labor and returns on capital going to capital, and that gives the people in the economy the wherewithal to turn around and buy what they just produced. It's called Say's Law, in effect. Supply creates income, creates output, creates demand, because you've got the income to buy the output. And that's assuming that nobody's silly enough to keep producing something that doesn't sell. As long as, as, long as you're producing something that people find attractive, if the opportunity arises, people will produce it and people will use it. And that's what Say meant when he said that supply creates its own demand. There was a time way, way back when people said, well, there might not be enough gold being mined or silver being mined to give you enough money to buy everything and demand might fall short of supply. And say said, that's silly. Prices would simply fall, and you'd have plenty of money to buy everything that's being produced. And then the other thing was, well, people might not want to buy everything that we could produce. And say would say, look, wants are infinite. Needs may be finite, but those electronic devices in your pockets that are so neat, you don't really need them, do you? But we buy them, and we spend a ton of money on them. What we can do, we do, and we enjoy doing it. OK, what happens when you cut taxes on capital and the capital stock grows? The capital labor ratio goes up. Workers become more productive. If they're more productive, the marginal product of labor rises. That's the demand curve for labor by employers. If workers are producing more, he can sell more. He's willing to hire them away from some other use, put them in his factory, produce to meet the higher demand that he's just experienced and the wages bid up. This is the only way to get rising real incomes over time, is to have something that raises the marginal product of labor, because we can only consume what we produce. And that comes from two sources, capital deepening, more capital per worker, and that can include human capital, like better education and training, or a technological advance that somehow makes it possible for us to produce more in less time. But either way, the marginal product of labor goes up, and, and that's a good thing. But the capital returns are competed away, as I showed you before. They come back down to about 3% real after-tax returns.
but the, uh, the rising real wage is really there. That's the big deal. And I don't care who owns the capital. I don't care if it's a, an American company that put a factory in Illinois or a French company that put a factory in Illinois. The factory's in Illinois, and Illinois workers are going to get some jobs and get higher wages. And that, that's a good thing. We'll get more into the international side of this perhaps next time. Now, sometimes we hear that, oh, well, if you cut their taxes or if their wages go up, they're going to feel so rich, they're going to take time off, and you'll actually have less labor supplied. And if you cut the tax rate, you're going to get even less labor supplied. You have to raise taxes on labor to lower their income so they'll have to work longer. People just don't do that. We, 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 we don't see this. Uh, it's, a, it's a claim that is more wishful thinking uh, than anything else. Uh, these income effects are, are really odd. Again, if Aunt Fanny wins the lottery and gets $200 million, which as a lump sum after tax is probably only $75 million, but anyway, uh, if she gets her $75 million, she can retire. But all the other people who spent the $1 on the lottery ticket are now out of buck, and every bit of money that she got was taken from somebody else, and their incomes went down while hers went up. You don't get this. You, you just don't get this uh, business. Now, I mentioned earlier that the tax rate and the tax base interact. First of all, the tax revenue is the tax rate uh, times the base. And if the base doesn't move, it's a simple matter of arithmetic. If you double the tax rate, you double the revenue. But if the incremental income does not match the taxable incremental income, you have to make an adjustment. And in this example, I'm saying, suppose uh, suppose you earn an extra dollar, which is the actual incremental income, but because of that, we make you report a dollar and fifty cents in taxable income, such that your taxable income did not match your actual income change. What's your tax rate? Well, if you were in the fifteen percent bracket and you had to report a dollar and fifty cents, your tax is fifteen percent times a dollar fifty, which is twenty-two and a half cents and you're really in the 22.5% bracket, not the 15, if we were to do this to you, would we ever do this to you? You're not old enough, but ask your grandparents. If they're paying tax on Social Security benefits, when their income goes up by a dollar over the first threshold, they have to report 50 cents in benefits as taxable. So that extra dollar of income triggers an extra 50 cents in taxable income, and they have to pay not 15 cents, but 22 and a half cents. Now, the recent tax bill lowered the 15% bracket to 12, so it's only 18 extra cents instead of 22 and a half. But you see the principle. If the income taxed does not match the income earned, you have to adjust your statutory rate in your head as to where they are uh, in, in terms of the marginal bracket. Here are the new brackets, 12, 22, 24, 32, 35, and 37, slightly down from where they were. You also have to look at the bracket numbers because a few people actually have been bumped up a bracket so that even though the rate came down, they still might at the margin have a slightly higher tax bill. But most people under the new bill will be paying less and most people will have very slightly lower marginal tax rates on their wages. And we didn't touch capital gains and dividends taxes, which have their own rates and bracket structure. So we, we didn't improve the tax treatment of capital so much, uh, but we did improve the tax treatment of labor in this fashion. And also, we took a little bit less from your grandparents. This is an older chart. We haven't updated it. It's just a mess to update, I mean, really. But you have the child credit, which comes in with a negative tax subsidy up to a point, and then it goes to zero. You have the earned income credit, which is a negative tax rate subsidy until you get to your peak, and then it flattens out, and then you begin losing it, which is a nice tax hike on you when you have that incremental income. And you have the federal income tax steps that go up. And you have the flat payroll tax, and then you have the state tax, which we've shown as a, a flat number, but they actually are slightly graduated. And by the time you add up all these marginal effects from earning an extra dollar, you can find uh, lower end of the middle income people paying taxes in the 40% to 46% area. Now, under the new law, it's probably a little bit lower than that, uh, but not a lot. And all of these numbers change every year with inflation, so you can see why we don't update the chart annually. But uh, this is called the skyscraper chart, and it's been around for a long time, and uh, uh, some people find it uh, 
finding and some people find it horrifying. Take your pick. But this is what goes on when you pass bills and you don't really do all the arithmetic. Uh, so I uh, kind of hope you will take into account what some of the consequences, some of them unintended, might be uh, as you pass some of these more complicated features of the tax system. Uh, this is a bit of more elaboration on the taxation of Social Security benefits. Uh, if you're in the 10% bracket and you are over your uh, 25,000 single or uh, $32,000 minimum threshold uh, joint filing, and you're getting your Social Security, you begin to have to show 50 cents uh, of a Social Security benefit taxable for every dollar you're over the threshold. Now that threshold is all your wage income, all your interest income, and dividend income, and so forth, but also your municipal bond income. So it's really not completely exempt from tax, is it? If you pass a tax provision, or somebody passes one, and you're looking at it, and you're on the staff, and you say, oh, look at that loophole. I know how to get around that. Never tell somebody who writes newspaper columns. They'll spill it, and then the Senate Finance Committee will plug the loophole by adding the tax-exempt interest to this calculation of your MAGI, your Modified Adjusted Gross Income. I gave it to him for you know, off the record, and he wrote about it, and uh, they, they plugged it before the bill went to the floor. I was so disappointed. Uh, anyway, but uh, this, this, is, this is how we tax Social Security. Now, if you go over the second tier, which is 34,000 for a single person and 44,000 for a married couple, uh, you have to start reporting 85 cents on each additional dollar of Social Security income, uh, and so up to the point where you might have 85% of your benefits taxed. Um, and so depending on which bracket you're in, uh, NA means you can't get to that higher bracket without going over the next tier. So anyway, you, you have rates that can go up to 40.7% uh, uh, under the new law. Now this was about five or six points higher under the old law. So it's, it's kind of a high rate uh, of, of punishment. Now this is wage income, not interest or in dividend income. Uh, if you're not subject to the Social Security earnings test, uh, the wages have the income tax that we just calculated with that bump up, plus the payroll tax. And this is a self-employed person, and I use the self-employed rate. And rates can get above 53% uh, if you're self-employed and, and uh, in the 22% tax bracket. Now, if it's subject to the earnings test, which is age 62 through the normal retirement age, which is currently it's going to be 67 now going forward, um, and you're subject either to, to the first 50% phase-in or the 85% phase-in, these are your tax rates on additional income. And before the bill was passed, that 93.9 was over 109%. We were saying to the oldest, most experienced, most productive workers, stop! You're going to lose money if you take that paycheck. That's not the right thing to do. Now, you don't lose it forever. If you lose money due to the earnings test, Social Security keeps track of what they didn't pay you. And when your earnings then drop below the earnings test exempt amount threshold and you start getting your benefits again, they pay you back. But they pay you back over your expected lifetime. And if you're in the bottom half of that distribution, you're not going to get everything back that you lost. And if you're above it, you do. Uh, but that's, run, that's rolling the dice. And if you don't want to take the gamble. And we do notice a lot of earnings reported by the older folks dropping off very suddenly when they approach that Social Security uh, earnings threshold at which you begin losing benefits. So it does affect the labor force participation of the recipients. I mentioned that some things were taxed more than once, and when they are, you have to compound the tax rates. If I take half of your money in the first round, and you only have half left, and then I take half of it again, uh, it's another 25% out of the remaining 50%. We've now got three quarters. That's compounding. That's what I mean by compounding. So here, here's how we have uh, uh, an income tax structure. Uh, we have uh, the tax on your earnings when you first earn it. There's the income tax and the payroll tax. Now, if you save the money and you have interest coming in, uh, uh, or if you put it into a small business and you earn some profit, uh, then that return on the saving that was already taxed is taxed again. 
If you put your money into a corporate form, into a share of stock, the corporation is paying some of the tax on the returns, and then they pass the rest on to you as dividends, or they keep it reinvested, the company becomes more valuable and there's a capital gain, which you take later. But th there's that second layer of tax, again, on the corporate earnings at the shareholder level, on top of the fact that they already paid tax on the money that they used to buy the shares with in the first place. That's a third layer of tax. And if you have enough money left uh, toward the end of life, and we do periodically increase the exempt amounts, but if you really look at them closely, it's just about enough to keep a couple in an assisted living facility for 10 years. So if you're, you're trying to protect yourself, even several million dollars is not that great a number. But in any event, there's the estate and gift tax. Now some people say the estate and gift tax doesn't matter because if these people don't invest in that stock, somebody else will buy it. Or if Americans don't put up that factory, the Europeans will come in and put it up for us and so forth. These capital inflows are terribly important. And the one reason why we don't show deficits having a major impact on American interest rates or investment in the United States. Capital inflows are huge. And there are many European firms that own steel mills or automobile factories in the United States. There are Japanese firms that own automobile factories in the United States. But when you get down to the local dry cleaning chain, or the mom and pop grocery store, or the family farm, you're not getting Japanese money. If Americans aren't supplying the saving and investing in these things, and the owners aren't, because their estate tax is too high, you are going to suffer. Now part of the loss is due to the fact that they won't put up the silo, or they won't buy the tractor, or they, whatever it is. Uh, they're, they're investing in. But part of it is that since they don't buy these things, they don't have anything to work with, so they don't work as much, they retire earlier, and so on. You're losing both the capital and their intellectual capital. And we use the estate tax on the capital in estates as a proxy for the sum of the physical capital plus the intellectual capital, because we don't have good data on how much of each there is. It's a proxy, but we, we, we do it. And we really do believe the estate tax does hurt capital formation, some other opinions to the contrary. So here you have four layers of tax on income used for saving and investment, and the one layer of tax, first one, on income used for consumption. This distorts the choice between consuming now and consuming later by saving for a while, letting it build up, and then consuming it at some point in the future. And by affecting that choice, because we have a low tax rate on this activity and a high tax rate on that activity, instead of a nice even flat tax rate on all activities, if you remember that first graph with the extra, second graph with those extra triangles, when you raise the rates on some things and lower the rates on other things, you get this distortion. And, and this is a big deal. In a pure consumption-based tax, where the first layer of tax applies and nothing else is done, if you substituted a value-added tax or a national sales tax for the entire federal tax system, GDP would be about 10% higher. Year in, year out. Wages would be about 10% higher. Well, wage, the wages earned would be about 10% higher. Some of that would be a higher wage, and some of that would be more people wanting to work. It'd be split between hours and wage per hour, but you'd have that big increase. Now, if you are taking 10% off the economy by having a distorting tax system, we have a $20 trillion economy. Marginal rate of time preference is 3%. You have to multiply the 20 by 33 to get a lump sum. So that's 66 or $67 trillion lump sum that we're giving up in present value by having a distorting tax system. It's a lot of money. Most of the major tax reforms that were being thought up and written up in the 80s and 90s, such as the flat tax, the, 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 the VAT, the uh, fair tax, the consumed income tax, David Bradford's X tax, the, uh, which was the basis of the AEI tax system that they published, which is called the consumed income tax or the tax system that we put out at uh, IRET, the, uh, my old institute, and which is up on the Tax Foundation site too, is, is a cash flow tax. It looked like an income tax, but you deduct all your saving and, and uh, not just some that you put into an IRA, all saving is deductible. And then when you take it out, all of it's taxable. 
Uh, these are called universal savings accounts. They're moving in that direction in Canada and the United Kingdom. Uh, and you have expensing of plant and equipment, and you don't have the estate tax. You've gotten rid of these three extra layers, and you're at, in effect, a consumption-based tax, which is neutral between current and future consumption. And you gradually build up toward where you're getting some of this $67 trillion. <laughs> Uh, but that would be uh, a different kind of tax reform than the one we just had, which simply moderated some of these double taxes but didn't get rid of them entirely. Here's the combined top federal corporate and shareholder marginal tax rates on corporate income. Uh, the corporate tax only used to be 35%, now it's 21, that's a big drop. But as you have that saving at the corporate level and you get dividend taxes and capital gains taxes on the extra tax passed through, extra income passed through to the shareholder, uh, you find that at a 15% rate, uh, the cut is still significant, but not quite as big as you might have thought. 20%, 23.8% that, you know, that add-on Medicare-related hit on capital income that was put in a few years ago. Uh, you get, uh, still, you get a reduction in, in the tax on the corporate sector, not just quite as much as you might think. And this is what I mean when I, I, I say that you have to watch these compoundings. And Treasury and uh, joint tax, when they do a corporate tax cut estimate, are supposed to say, oh, by the way, that means that the dividends will be higher, and that means we're going to get some of that money back. And they're supposed to build that into their revenue estimates. At least we hope they're doing that. Now, what is the advantage of a tax-deferred saving account or pension or IRA or 401k or whatever uh, to the uh, saver? Here's somebody saving uh, a flat $1,000 from age 18 to age 70. Uh, and, and the bottom line, it's taxed annually, and so there's less to reinvest. And in the top line, it's tax deferred. And uh, you've got at age 70, $400,000 uh, from the tax deferred account and $240,000 from the ordinary account. It's losing about 30% of uh, uh, what you would otherwise be able to get if you put everything into the IRA instead of the uh, uh, ordinary saving. And of course, people do max out sometimes and they can't put more in, and that's what the universal savings account concept in Britain and Canada are designed to do. They're not truly universal, there are limits, but they're pretty big. And uh, they have the, uh, the Canadians say, look, if you, if you are young and you can't manage to save your whatever it is, $5,000 this year, uh, you can carry the unused balance forward. So by the time you're 33 and you've climbed the corporate ladder or whatever ladder you're climbing, uh, you can catch up. Uh, and get your full lifetime benefit. Of course, the earlier you save, the better. Uh, if you're getting a 7% return, something you save will double every 10 years. So what you put in at age 20 will double by age 30. What you put in at age 30 will double by age 40, but what you put in at age 20 now is quadrupled. If you do the arithmetic, as you go out, what you get the first year overwhelms everything you do afterwards. <laughs> each decade. Uh, it's really much better to save in your 20s than in your 50s. Uh, you've got compound interest working in your favor, and it's a huge effect. So if you have kids and you're doing some saving, stick it into their account, not yours, and let them have the uh, added years of uh, inside buildup. That means you may have to uh, make sure they're earning enough money to be allowed to put money into your, your, IRA, your uh, 401k or your IRA, but whatever. Anyway. Um, now here we have the estate tax, uh, you get a 40% top rate, you have that exempt amount, so you mostly start off close to the 40% maximum rate if you're going to be taxed at all. Now the, the, the Congress and the IRS really don't like to hit one group and hurt another, so they're, they're very democratic here. If you uh, uh, give money to your grandchildren, your kids might feel left out. So we put the tax on as if you have given it to your children and that they have then turned around and given it to the grandchildren. And so we apply the tax twice. And you get the tax on the first transfer and then the second imputed transfer that didn't really happen. And we kind of double up on the tax and it's the 64% tax in the generation skipping tax. Just to treat, you know, don't want kids to feel left out. All right, uh, that's of course really not why they do it. It's because your bosses wanted more revenue. Anyway. Then we have a tax on a dollar of interest left in the state. This is now someone who's earning to add to an estate, not someone who's already got it. And you have to pay your income tax on the interest 
and the state income tax and the light blue on the interest, and then you have the two generation skipping and, and estate taxes to get up to a potential marginal rate of 77%. And then if it's wages, you also have the payroll tax. And you're over 81%, almost 82. Now before the, the tax bill we just passed, that 81% was nearer 88. <laughs> but you, you see, these, these, these things do have a size that you must admit should have an effect on people's behavior. Uh, if they're paying any attention at all. And finally, and this is just a teaser for next week, depreciation rules. Depreciation affects the tax base, how much you have to tax if you have a business. I bought a cash register this year for $1,000. Do I write it all off and take $1,000 off my current income? Or do I have to write off $200 a year for five years? So my current income's a little higher, my future income's a little lower and the taxes are kind of pulled forward instead of being paid later, okay? Uh, if we take the present value of those write-offs, we know that $200 a year for five years isn't worth a full thousand, and take the difference and measure it and say, well, look, only some of the cost is allowed in present value over the life of the asset, so some additional income is taxed that wouldn't be under a cash flow tax, and therefore there's a little bit more tax owed on that machine than if you actually said, all right, if you spend the $1,000 this year, you deduct it this year. And that's the added tax that discourages investment relative to consumption in a physical asset as opposed to a financial asset. Uh, moving toward expensing uh, for equipment gets rid of that loss in present value and makes it like a true cash flow tax. And the lower corporate rate, that's a 35% rate, the 21% rate would knock that down to about $8 instead of 13, but it's still there. Uh, and the only way to get rid of it uh, is to uh, have the corporate rate at zero. So expensing, you see, is, is kind of more powerful than a corporate rate cut uh, in boosting the incentive to buy a machine. Uh, and uh, that, that's why we, we, we have found that uh, an acceleration of the depreciation is more likely to give you enough added wages and enough added employment to more than cover the cost of the faster write-off, whereas the corporate rate doesn't quite get you there. Close, not quite. Okay, if we were to do a complete tax reform, moving to a consumed income or cash flow tax, what would we be doing? We'd be expensing all investment, structures as well as equipment. We'd make saving either tax deferred as in the universal savings accounts, or returns exempt as in the Roth. They're almost the same. If you're in the same tax bracket early in your life and later in your life, then whether you deduct it now and pay tax later, or you pay the tax now and don't pay the tax later, it's all the same in present value, assuming you have a reasonably normal return. If you have a loss, the timing hurts you. If you have a really great gain, the government is sharing that gain with you with the saving deferred tax, because when you take out that huge windfall, they're getting their share. They don't share it with you if you have the Roth. They've already taken the tax. You've got a great gain. They're not getting that part at the other end, but they're also not taking the risk of your having a loss. So they are a little bit different. Uh, I kind of favor the deferred approach rather than the other one. Some people here favor the Roth approach, and you've seen that in the blueprint, for example, the, house, the old house blueprint, uh, where they went for the Roth because initially you're still taking the tax and the loss of tax revenue is later and uh, doesn't hurt the near-term federal budget as much. Uh, but uh, uh, the government probably makes out a little bit better with the, with the deferred kind. By the way, if you're encouraging people to put money into the IRA and they were gonna do the saving anyway, then having taxed it as it accrued would have brought you more revenue, except for the added growth, which would have given you some offset to that. But if there's new saving in the IRA that the people would not have done except for the IRA, then all those future returns are new money. The government wasn't gonna get. And if the percent of money going into the IRA is new saving is bigger than the, per, the, the percent on their marginal tax bracket, the government comes out ahead. 
And most resource, uh, research shows that the amount of new money going into IRAs that boosts people's propensity to save is enough to cover the near-term revenue hit. Uh, and the government is actually ahead on the deal, even before counting the added economic growth. The other thing you need to do is to stop taxing the corporation income twice. The revenues that are coming in from the corporate investment should be taxed at the business level or at the individual level, not on both. Or if you're going to tax it twice, make sure that the combined compounded sum is the same as on a pass-through business. Right now, the corporation with the shareholder tax is paying more than the uh, pass-throughs under old law and is still paying more than the pass-throughs under new law. Uh, the, uh, in spite of that, but partly because of the, the you know, that, that exclusion for the pass-throughs that went into the current bill that covers some of the return on the pass-through business and limits uh, their tax rate. And finally, the estate and gift tax is an extra layer of tax on the capital that shouldn't be there. If you take these steps, you have converted the income tax into a consumed income tax, and you're on the road to collecting that $67 trillion. Uh, in present value of additional GDP on behalf, not for the government, but on behalf of the, the public, um, which strikes me as a good idea, but uh, uh, apparently the Congress and the government have a higher discount rate than the average 3% marginal rate of time preference uh, out there in the public. They prefer the money now rather than later. But these costs that are imposed by trying to do that uh, are really uh, quite substantial. So next week we'll start looking at a whole variety of ways of getting some of this done uh, for what I hope will be another round of tax reform before another 30 years have gone by. Uh, any questions? I haven't offended anybody's sensibilities about the morality of the tax code? No, okay. Well, uh, Hope to see you next week. Thank you.